this Sunday. Mikey will preach next Sunday. And then Missy's wanting a Sunday off. She's got something she's going to go do. So Mikey's going to be in the charge of the music that Sunday, and I'm going to preach again. So you're going to get us every other week here for about four weeks. So uh, anyway, and for all of you who are nervous to say, I I've got a kick out of this. This is fine. You know, Mikey is a great preacher. I, I really enjoy listening to him, and I know many of you do. And for you that say he's better than me, it's okay. <laughs> it is okay. I'm, uh, I'm quite comfortable with that. If he doesn't get any better than this, it's not going to be that great. So he, he does okay, and I'm very thankful that we've got him back. It helps me a great deal. Today I want to continue on in the series, Me or God. Today it's my problem, or is it an opportunity? Remember the children's game, hide and seek? Ready or not, here I come. Most of us have played that at some time or another. Someone uh, goes and hides their eyes and starts counting. And you, you're not supposed to peek, by the way, Lois Dean. Uh, and, uh, so uh, you're, you're, look, you're not looking and someone goes off and hides and you're going to seek them out. Most of us can remember good memories of childhood playing that game and enjoying the, the time with uh, kids that we would grow up with and have our, our early life with. Those were good, good memories. Well, life is filled with a whole lot of ready or not, here I come. I'm sure most of you would agree with that. Let's think about a couple. Marriage. Marriage. Most of us could say that marriage is one of those things we may not have been as ready for as we thought we were. Now, what does that mean? Man, I didn't know there could be so many things in a bathroom, for instance, you know? Uh, all the changes that would take place. Uh, there was, I have noticed our house was different. I, even as a, a youngster, being married young, even as a youngster, Deb decorated our house well for each season. I didn't know that just didn't happen. Uh, there's a woman in the house, things start to change. You just notice that. There's candles burning. You know, for a guy, if a candle's burning, it's not because of that, you know, so it's a different world. So most of us could say, well, ready or not, we did it. How about, I like this one. All right, you ready for this one? Man, it's one thing when we're excited about having a baby. Wow, that's good. Ready or not, here comes parenting. <laughs> You know, it's really good to have that baby. That's an exciting thing to have. Hey, we're going to have a new baby. Oh, that's great. And then they said, wait till she's 14 and some guy's making eyes at her. <laughs> and son, I'm not going to be around here to take care of it by then. Just be prepared, all right? <laughs> the girls come and showed me their prom dresses yesterday. And I said, wait, we need a couple great big guys to go with you <laughs> that are old. Yeah, ready or not, it's going to happen. So you have marriage, you have parenting, that brings responsibility. How about home ownership? You know, it's really good to rent because you can call and say, hey, come and fix this. <laughs> yeah, see how that works for you too. But anyway, home ownership, all these changes, all these things that you're responsible for. Stretching that paycheck, no longer you eating at mom and dad's table. Ready or not, here it comes, it's going to happen. Well, folks, the same can be said about adversities in our life. Ready or not, they're going to come your way. So when adversities, eh, hardship, let's give them some name, turmoils, calamity, troubles, misfortune. I like that one. Whenever they do come, we must decide how are we going to deal with that. Now, there's two ways. I can deal with it by myself, and I call that me. It's my problem, I'll take care of it. Or... I can deal with it with God's help. And that's what I call God. And I call that opportunity. That I can learn and grow through this. Let's look at a few of these if we may. Sometimes life can uh, be just downright difficult. It can be tough. It's my problem. When it's my problem, it can be very tough. You ever have anyone say to you, well, sorry about your luck. Yeah, you've heard that a time or two. Well, usually when you hear that, it's because things aren't going very well. First of all, problems and adversities... They're nothing new. They've been around as long as the world's been around. They're nothing new. And remember, everybody has them. Look to your left. Look to your right. See those people that are sitting down there that are smiling? You know why they're smiling? Because they know that I'm talking about them as well. We've all got them. 
No matter where you look, we're supposed to, yeah, I know, we got them. It's just life. Adversities. Now here's the kicker. Not only do we have them, but let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 is just filled with... Uh, yeah, chapter 4 is where we're going to start. <clears throat> it just gives us so much that Jesus was tempted in every way that we were. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted, tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus is tempted in every manner that we have. So Temptations are very real. Now, if you just drop back a chapter here over to chapter 2. Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 18. This is the one that really will enlighten you about Jesus and have an understanding about it. Verse 18. Because he himself, he being Jesus, suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Can you imagine the Son of God suffering with temptations. Now I've wondered what kind of temptation. Well, he was tempted in every manner that we are, so you just quit wondering and start thinking the whole gambit. But I had one or two come to mind. I can only imagine what it must have been like whenever those Pharisees were giving in a hard time. It'd been easy to say, you don't know who you're messing with. You don't know who you're messing with. And he could have done something about it. Or whenever they said, if you're the Son of God, take yourself off the cross. You healed others, heal yourself. Man, can't you just see their eyes if he'd come off the cross? We wouldn't have had a future. Now, not only because of Jesus, but everyone would have died. They'd been scared to death. This guy just come off the cross. They'd been all of these things. All of these things. Tempted in every manner that we have. You know those days whenever he wanted to get up in the morning and he had a preaching assignment and he was going to go out and speak to people and he's thinking, what's the use? They're not paying attention. That's a temptation to say, I'm just going to forget it. Father, just bring me home. I'm going to forget it. A temptation. Or maybe it's a temptation to say, you know, so you may be hungry. Get over it. We're all hungry at times. But instead he fed the thousands there's all of those things. See, he suffered with temptation just like we do. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, this is where it really starts applying to us. Matthew chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4 says, When he came down from the mountainside, that's Jesus, when Jesus came down, a large crowd followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. First of all, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. He said, I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift of Moses uh, commanded as a testimony to them. Here's a man with leprosy. Now, the reason I've chosen this as the illustration for where we're at today, leprosy was one of the most dreaded things in all the old world. It was one of the most dreaded diseases of ancient time. A leper would suffer in every facet, every facet. There would be unkindness. He would have to stand, if someone was coming and go, leper, leper, he'd have to holler out. And let them know, unclean, unclean. And let them know that they should not come near. There would be the unkindness that would be expressed to him because of his disease. And because of the appearance that, that he may have because of it. Because leprosy was a cruel disease and it was a deforming disease. There would be apathy. Well, I don't care, with, just stay away from me. Just stay away from me, I don't care who you are, stay away. Apathy. There would be rejection, rejection. Or they would be a, a, a time whenever they would be hungry. Now, how would a leper be fed? Did you ever think about that? It's not like they could have their own place because they're wandering the countryside, basically. Family would identify a spot. There's a stump out there on the back 40 and we're going to bring food out there and put it there. They often didn't want to be associated with him. 
So they would put the food out there and, and he or she would find that food. And that would be how they would be fed. They would be dressed in rags and filthy because there was nothing else for them. Apathy, rejection, betrayal, hate. They hated them because of the disease that they had. Hated them. Now, these are just some of the symptoms of what would take place. I call them symptoms because each one of these are something that didn't have to happen. But as a result of what was going on in their life, these things did happen to them. So now let's take that and apply that to us just a little bit. Many of us have suffered from some, if not all, of these things that a leper would suffer from. We can say that we have suffered unkindness. There's not many people here who have not been able to say, oh yeah, I've had some unkind things said to me. Apathy, that there are those that just don't care about or have been, been rejected. There's times that we have felt betrayed by a friend or a loved one, someone that we've been acquainted with. And there's times that we just experience hatred. Hatred. Our world is filled with hatred right now towards the church for whatever reason. And we see it. Many of us have suffered and see these things taking place. And whenever that takes place, what are you tempted to do? Well, you look at yourself. That's a me, a me. And whenever you start looking at yourself, you are tempted to withdraw. Or you'll lash out, you'll strike back. Many times when trouble comes, one way that uh, we deal with it is we internalize it. Woe is me. Me. We've made it all about me. When life is all about me, the problem is very real. It's very personal. It can be money related. It can be family responsibilities. It can be work responsibilities. But it becomes about me. How many times have we heard someone say, well, I was passed over for that promotion and it should have been mine. They weren't there as long as... That's about me. Or we have other cases where we feel that I, me, I've been rejected by this or that. And whenever it is about me, I have a tendency to deal with it by myself. Now, most of us do that. If we don't have God in our life, most people deal with it by themselves. Oh, you may strike out or you may complain or be bitter a little bit, but how else do we do it? We go home and we get in the dumps. We call it depression. People become very depressed about their state, about the situation that their life is in. They start looking around and saying, woe is me. And I have to suffer with it all by myself. But folks, it doesn't have to be that way. That's the whole key today. It doesn't have to be that way. Whenever we deal with these things by ourselves, we will have the symptoms that is experienced by the leper. Because we'll say, I'm unclean. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants me around. We will start suffering in various aspects and forms because it's about me. But now let's take that same thing and let's see if we can make it an opportunity. See, life is filled with opportunities. We have opportunities in every one of the fields that I've just talked to you about. We have an opportunity, if someone is unkind, we have an opportunity to express kindness. If someone expresses apathy, which is I don't care, we have the opportunity to show uh, concern and caring. If someone expresses rejection, we can embrace them. If someone expresses betrayal, we can show loyalty. If someone expresses hate, we can show love. There's opportunities in every one of them. We have the opportunities to develop friendships, relationships with people and to show them that God is at work in our life. We have the opportunities to develop financial security. We have the opportunities to develop our careers. We have the opportunity to develop education. We have the opportunity to develop our family around the Lord and on and on and on we could go. Many times we miss it because we, our problems, have not provided opportunities. Instead, we have missed the opportunity 
because we see it as a problem. Today I want to ask you to see it as an opportunity. To use your adversities to grow, to grow. Every one of us needs to grow in Christ. Whether it's someone who's been in the church 96 years, Mary, that's you, I'm talking about you. <laughs> All right, I just want to make sure that you're with me. Or whether somebody has been in the church six years, we need to make sure that it's an opportunity to grow. We can grow in hope. Now I want each of you to think about, if I have this depression, what do I need? I need a little hope. So where are you going to look for hope? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We start looking to the Lord. And we, it says there's faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, but hope made the top three. That I have this hope. Did any of you come to church thinking that church was going to make your life worse? Probably not. Did any of you decide that, you know, maybe I need to seek out a relationship with the Lord because He doesn't like me anyway, He might as well know me personally? Probably not. You were looking for a relationship with Him because you wanted to know Him better and you wanted Him to know you better. And you started developing a hope that was on Him and entirely upon Him. Where you realize that he was putting something into your life that you didn't have before. Is there anyone here who believes that you don't have a better life with Jesus in it than you did before he was in it? Probably not. Probably not. Now I could say, is there any of us here who have had more difficulties with him in it than we did before? Well, there are more difficulties having Jesus in my life than not having him in my life. When he's not in my life, Mike's in charge. I do the way I want unless Deb tells me I can't. And it's just the way it is. Right? But whenever Jesus is in charge, all of a sudden things start changing. And I'll be doing something and he'll go, uh, Mike. I'm not going to tell you what that is. He'll go, Mike. He'll get my attention. How about your love? Have you found that you can be more loving and reaching out with God in your life than you was before? Do you find that you're a little bit more generous than you were before? That may be under the trust. And all of a sudden we start developing this trust in God. I believe that God is going to take care of us. Now, I appreciate Denny's devotion very much. I saw Deb look at me and I looked at her because we practice tithing as well. And there's times you're thinking, where did that come from? How did we have that left? <clears throat> she made a house payment the other day and I go, how did you have that much left? She's holding out on me. I've come to that conclusion. There is no way we could have done that. I must have been looking at a new car or something because she, she said, we did it. With God, if I'm going to develop opportunity, if I'm going to make an opportunity, what's that doing to my depression? Now my confidence is growing. I'm more confident in, uh, in ever in my relationship with him. In my relationship with Jesus. With Jesus. With my relationship with him. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1. And verses 6 and 7. And to say this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may uh, have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which is perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and have um, result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. That my faith is greater than anything else. That adversities can come and they can cause me to, to fail or they can help me to grow. To grow my faith in my adversities can prove a genuine faith. I don't know what all your adversities are today. Let's stop here and think about our faith. Let's, let's take just a moment and consider our faith. I want you to think about your adversity. Is your faith genuine? There's some of you that are going through some major health issues, and I know that. We've had many of you on our prayer list. 
we mentioned when there's certain procedures going on. That's a time to check our faith to see how genuine it is. You know, everyone take note, this is things preachers aren't supposed to tell you. It's real easy to be faithful when everything's good. When everything's going your way, it's really easy to say, praise God, great things are happening. But when things aren't going well, it's not always as easy to say, praise God, great things are happening. That can be in your health. That can be in your family situation. That can be in your financial situation. As long as the money's flowing, it's easy to say, oh, God's really blessing us. But whenever the payments get a little tough to make, it's hard to say, yeah, God's really blessing us. Whenever we have a death in our family, it's hard to say, yeah, God's really still with me. He's still walking with me. I can feel his presence. Sometimes those are hard, folks. That's why we have to find out, is it me or God? Is this an opportunity? So the first thing I want you to examine today is your faith. Your faith. Think about your faith. Will your faith take you through the hard times, the difficult times? I can remember having a, um, a man in World War II tell me many, many years ago. He said, I was in a foxhole when word of Roosevelt's death come. The war was almost over, folks. It was almost done. And he said, everyone in the area lost hope. It was the worst thing that we could find out that he had died. Because we lost hope. We thought we'll never go home again. Faith. Sometimes we can lose hope because our faith isn't refined. I want you to refine your faith. I want each of you to start working on that relationship with God where your faith is refined. Folks, church isn't about who's preaching or who's not preaching. It's not about who's serving, whether it's a man or a woman or, it doesn't matter. It's about what do I believe about God? Is God going to get me through this valley? That's faith. Next thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses um, 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our times of trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. He comforts in our troubles. He comforts in our troubles. My opportunity to grow, to learn from my adversity, is to learn that even in my troubled times, God puts his arms about me. I have to learn that he cares. Most of us, now everyone take note, these are things you aren't supposed to hear, but you're hearing them today. Most of us, at some time or another, have found ourselves saying, I don't even know if he cares anymore. Some of you have even told me that. I don't even know if he cares anymore. God cares to comfort us in our troubles. I want you to visualize, you know how I am about those visions. I want you to visualize God putting his arms around you and comforting you. You ever had someone just come up and comfort you by putting their arms around you? Whether it's at a time of death or illness or just a time when you've just got some bad news, whatever it might be, and they just put their arms, don't say anything. They just put their arms about you. It's an opportunity to grow. If I believe that God is comforting me that way, and it helps as I grow to do what? To encourage others. So now, if it's about me, I don't care if I encourage you or not. If it's about God, I want to encourage you. I want you to know something that most of us who love God have found. That he's real. 
that he's real that he comforts me he walks with me and talks with me let's go over to Philemon I'm sorry Philippians Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8 and following what is more I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in death, and so somehow to obtain the resurrection from the dead." The apostles writing I've counted everything lost anything that could have been mine I count lost compared to knowing Christ is knowing Jesus the most important thing in your life now it's a, there's other important things your relationships your marriage your children all of those are important things every one of them we all have time invested in relationships, and those are important. Is there any of that more important than knowing Jesus? That Jesus is my first and foremost. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't want me to have these others. As much as I love most of you, not a one of you can get me to heaven. Not a one of you can get me there. As much as I care for most of you, not a one of you can do for me what Jesus does for me. Not a one of you. And as much as every one of you love me, you did catch that one, didn't you? All right. I can't do it for you. Nothing should be more valuable to us than our relationship with Jesus. I want to take you to one of my new favorite scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. I love this. Let's start at 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, and inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix your eyes on Jesus, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I have got all that underlined in red, and then I took a yellow marker for our light and momentary troubles. Our light and momentary troubles. Compared to eternity, that's all they are. Is light and momentary. Oh, we've all got issues. We've all got problems. We've all got adversities. But they're momentary. They're not going to last forever. It's just not going to happen. I remember wrecking the fender of my 64 Ford in 1968 broke my heart broke my heart I couldn't hardly stand it that car was really important to me and I didn't wreck it very bad just a little fender dinder but really did upset me I don't have the car I don't have the fender I got a different girl riding in the car than I had in 68 <laughs> world just changed huh it really seemed important in 1968. But that was light and momentary, folks. Light and momentary. Adversity, it's how you deal with it. One more scripture for you over in Proverbs. We use this one a lot, but we're going to use it again. Chapter 3, trust in the Lord, verse 5. With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't make it about a me. Make it about a him. If you make it about a me, 
That's your own understanding. If you make it about him, he'll help you understand. Me, I can't do a whole lot. I can't even do what I could five years ago. No, not a whole lot of me. But you know, everything I could do five years ago that I can't do now, Jesus is still doing everything he was doing five years ago. And the things I could do when I was 16 that I certainly couldn't do now, Jesus is still doing those same things. See, he's never changed yesterday, today, or forever. Are you a me? Or you are, let it be me and God. Let it be God and me. It's your choice. Life, it's a journey. If you journey by yourself, folks, it's long, it's tedious, it's unhappy. If you walk with the Lord, there's joy. Will you please stand as we have our invitation?